Hello and welcome to EGM 702, Photogrammetry and Advanced Image Analysis. This is Week 2, Part 6, DEM Applications. Before I get into the applications of DEMs, I want to talk a little bit about co-registering the DEMs. Small XY shifts between different DEMs can lead to very large differences in elevation. And we can see this where we take an original DEM, we translate it or shift it in space, um, either in the X or the Y direction or in the Z direction, so we add a little bit of a shift in elevation. And you can see that even though these are the same DEM, uh, we have a positive increase in ele or a positive difference in elevation on one side of a hill slope, a negative difference in elevation on the other side of the hill slope, as well as this elevation, this this mean bias or this elevation shift that we've introduced. What this looks like if we look if we plot this up in a map is it shows up as a hillshade style pattern. So you can see a hillshade hillshade for an area um, here on the left, and on the right we have the same area showing a DEM difference with two different DEMs that have been shifted slightly. And you can see that these look very, very similar. Um, we have areas where we have, um, we, we can see the you know, sort of negative elevation difference uh, shown in darker colors. On one side of a hill slope, we have positive elevation changes showing as lighter colors on the other side. Um, so we can see this hillshade style pattern as a result of these shifts or these translations. This, of course, leads us to a bias or a systematic error when we are estimating the differences between these DEMs. And in order to properly compare the DEMs or to use them for any sort of change analysis, uh, we need to first co-register them. So we need to remove any of these horizontal or vertical shifts uh, to make sure that when we are comparing the two DEMs, we are comparing just the elevation differences and not the elevation differences plus other translations. So the process of doing this is something called co-registration. Uh, one method of doing this uh, is to, do, to, to iteratively solve for the translations as a function of the aspect um, of the DEM. Uh, this method was uh, first proposed by Newth and Cab in a paper in 2011. Um, and what we're doing here is we are solving the equation shown here for different, um, for different parameters. So A, which gives us the magnitude of the shift, so how much of a translation we see in the x and y direction. Um, B, the direction of the shift, so what compass direction the shift is uh, occurring in, which enables us to calculate the x and y components of the shift, as well as this mean bias uh, that we're normalizing by the slope. And so what you can see here, if we plot our elevation differences, um, if we plot the aspect of our pixels versus the elevation difference normalized by the slope, you can see that there's a very clear sinusoidal pattern as a result of this, um, as a result of these different translations, and you can see what the different parameters look like on the actual uh, on the actual graph here, and so we go through um, and iteratively solve this. So we solve the first um, we we solve the first difference between the DEMs. We translate the DEMs based on the shifts that we calculate. Uh, we then try it again and see what the what the function um, as what the elevation difference looks like as a function of aspect, and we keep going until we don't see any, any aspect dependence on our elevation difference. So once we've done this, we can then use our DEMs for different applications. Um, so for example, we can use DEMs to co geometrically correct satellite images, as you saw in EGM 713. We can use them for different visualization purposes. We can use them to make shaded relief or hillshade maps. Uh, we can also use them to drape a satellite image or an aerial photo over the DEM uh, so that we get an, an idea of what the three-dimensional um, look of an area is, um, this example shown here. 
Uh, we can also use DMs to calculate the different topographic parameters that, I, that we discussed earlier in the week, um, as well as things like the solar illumination. So that's, dependent, that's heavily dependent on things like the aspect and whether an area is shaded or not, um, as well as things like the view shed. So we can go through and for each area in our DEM scene, we can figure out what, uh, what you can see from that point or conversely, what can be seen from that point. And finally, we can use them for change analysis. So starting with the field of hydrology, uh, there are a number of applications for DEMs in hydrology. Uh, we can use the slope and aspect to do some flow modeling, so to figure out where water would be flowing on the surface. Uh, we can use this to delineate watersheds and map river and stream networks, uh, but we can also use it to map things like flood depth and extent. And so the example shown here shows uh, a flood that was observed using, uh, I believe, Landsat images in 1990. And you can see the blue area showing where they've, uh, they've mapped the flood extent. And then we have different, um, different DEMs which give us different depths um, of floodwaters. And so by, by combining the flood extent mapped from the satellite images uh, with the DEM, we can work out things like the flood depth in different areas, we can work out the flood volume, uh, and so on. Uh, so this paper is available on Blackboard in the reading area. Uh, we have a number of applications, again, for DEMs in the field of forestry. Um, so we can use DEMs to calculate something called topographic exposure, or TOPEX, um, and this tells us how protected a particular area is from things like wind or, um, or other climate parameters. Um, so by doing this, we can help to re guide replanting efforts. So for example, uh, if we're looking to, to plant trees to help repopulate forests, we don't want young trees to be placed in areas where they're not uh, protected from the wind, where they might be exposed to heavy winds, uh, as that can damage them and inhibit their growth. And so by using parameters like the topographic exposure, we can help to um, uh, make sure that our planting efforts are as successful as possible. We can also use DMs to work out things like tree height and different structure. We discussed this in the, uh, the LIDAR lesson, uh, for example, how we can use LIDAR to work out different uh, parameters for trees. And we can also use them, uh, use DEM differencing uh, to learn more about things like deforestation. And so this example shown here uh, has the NDVI for an image in 2003, the same um, NDVI uh, for the same area in 2013. And you can see that there's a mask where we have significant change in the NDVI between the 2003 and the 2013 image. Um, and we can also use DEM differencing to work out the tree height change and if effectively the volume difference of the trees in this area. Um, so that's something that DEMs can, uh, can help us to, to work out. We can use DEMs to study landslides or rock avalanches. So the example that I'm showing here comes from a study from 2017 uh, that classified different rock avalanches or landslides since 1984 in Glacier Bay, Alaska. And you see an example of this here. Uh, this is a 2014 landslide that started uh, pretty far up on Mount La Perouse in Glacier Bay. And you can see that there was a very long run out uh, down the mountain, partly because of the, the height that it was uh, occurring on, but also because this was occurring over a relatively uh, smooth glacier surface. So we can use a DEM to do things like calculate the head scarp, so the elevation where the avalanche or the, the landslide was triggered. Um, we can also calculate things like the runout, so how far it's traveled along the ground, uh, as well as the aspect. And in fact, if you um, compare these uh, trigger locations to aspect and temperature records, uh, what it suggests is that a lot of these landslides that are occurring are occurring as a result of something called rock permafrost degradation. And so we have rock 
or bedrock that is permanently frozen in a lot of high mountain areas. Um, but as it warms up, it starts to expand. Um, there's liquid water that can come into cracks and cause different weathering processes, uh, which can actually trigger landslides. And so that's one thing that uh, the combination of the uh, classification of the landslides as well as the DEM uh, suggests a mechanism or a process that is causing these landslides to occur somewhat more frequently at higher elevations. And we can use the DEM to do things like model the runout, model landslides if it were to trigger at a particular location, for example. Uh, we can see what the potential effects are based on the size of the, um, based on the assumed size of the landslide or the rock avalanche. Uh, we've seen a number of examples in the field of volcanology um, from the practicals for last week and this week. Uh, so with repeat DEMs, we can do things like map lava flows or pyro lava or pyroclastic flow depth. Uh, we can work out the volume of material that was deposited. Um, we can uh, learn something about the landslides that are triggered during a volcanic eruption or even flank collapses where the entire side of a volcano uh, collapses and flows down the mountain. And we can use them to look at something called dome building. Um, so this is an example shown for the Bezimiani volcano in Kamchatka. Um, and in the 1950s, it went through a very large eruption that collapsed a huge portion of the flank of the mountain, much like what we saw with Mount St. Helens uh, in the practicals from last week and this week. Um, and you can see that as well, since the 1956 eruption, there has been significant regrowth of the mountain, uh, over 900 meters elevation increase as a result of volcanic processes that are ongoing. And this is something that we can, we can study uh, and monitor over time using DEMs. Uh, we can also use them to do things like model lava flows. So if we were to have an eruption, where would, uh, where would the lava or the pyroclastic material go? Um, and things like that. So number of, number of applications in volcanology as well. And I've talked a fair amount about glaciers just because this is where most of my background is. Um, but we can use DEMs for a number of different, in a number of different ways to study glaciers. Uh, for example, we can do things like model the surface mass balance, so how much snow is falling on the glacier compared to how much snow and ice is melting in a given year. We can use them to model or to estimate things like ice flow and ice thickness. And with repeat DEMs, we can work out things like volume change. And if we have enough repeat measurements, then we can start to look at the elevation differences over time as a time series rather than as a discrete uh, difference of two different DEMs. And so this example here uh, is for, um, from a study that used the entire Aster archive to observe glacier elevation changes between 2000 and 2020. And so you can see all of the different individual measurements here. And using some of the techniques that we talked about in the lecture on spatial statistics, uh, this study was able to observe, or, or rather to interpolate the glacier elevations over time in order to be able to, to calculate not just the uh, volume changes at discrete intervals throughout the, um, throughout the entire range of the study, uh, but also to more accurately estimate the elevation and volume uncertainty as a result of, of uh, using these different interpolation techniques. And so this example is from the Southern Patagonian ice field, uh, where we have areas where we have very large changes taking place. So an elevation drop of 200 meters over the span of about 20 years, uh, as well as sort of more slow elevation loss where the drop is only maybe uh, 20 or 30 meters over that same time period. And if we combine all of this into a map, uh, what this looks like for the Southern Patagonian and the Northern Patagonian ice field uh, is that we have a lot of areas with very significant elevation drop over the last 20 years but also some areas where there is actually some, some increase as a result of different glacier processes. 
Um, so by using DEMs, we're able to observe these different changes and learn more about uh, what's going on with glaciers around the world, as one example. To sum all of this up, um, before we compare DEMs, we need to make sure that they're co-registered. So we need to make sure that we remove any of the uh, biases that might be present as a result of horizontal and vertical shifts between DEMs. Um, there are lots of applications of DEMs in remote sensing, in geo and environmental sciences. I've covered a few of them in this lesson, but there's many, many more that you can look at. Um, they are a necessary input for a lot of different types of modeling. Um, so we need to not just be able to access DEMs, but we also need to be able to uh, analyze and assess them in order to uh, know how accurate the model results that we're getting are. And we can use them for different change analysis applications. Uh, I showed examples for glaciers and volcanoes, but there are loads of other, um, loads of other applications that you can find out there. Um, so there's some additional resources that I've included on Blackboard. Uh, there's the paper from Newth and Cab that talks about um, not just the iterative co-registration of DEMs, but also some other ways of analyzing the bias as a function of elevation, for example. Uh, that study that used different DEMs to look at mapping uh, flood depth um, is included there, as well as another one that has a number of different applications for DEM differencing the landslides, the volcanoes, uh, all of those are available on Blackboard. And then there's this website here, Using DEMs to Map Changes in Topography from the US Geological Survey, that actually looks at the changes that have taken place at Mount St. Helens since the 1980 collapse, uh, of, or the eruption and subsequent collapse of the mountain uh, that you can look more at uh, there. And then I've also included a link to the hydrology tool set uh, in ArcGIS, which you can use to, to learn more about the different tools that are available uh, either in ArcGIS or in other uh, GIS platforms. That's all for this week. I hope you found it interesting and useful. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.